Hello and welcome to the Evolve.ag podcast. I'm Wendy, your host, and I'm here today with Michelle Egger, the CEO of Biomilk. They are the first company in America creating cell-cultured breast milk. Welcome to the Evolve.ag podcast, Michelle. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I know you're a very, very busy woman. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to dig into it. I'd love for you just to do a little introduction for our audience. Maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, sure. So food scientist by training, I spent most of my career in dairy fermentation and commercialization, which is kind of ironic because I, I went to school for food science specifically at a university that didn't specialize in dairy. I'm from Minnesota and I grew up uh, with all of my family going to University of Wisconsin-Madison and was like, oh, I don't ever want to work in dairy. It's so complicated. Um, you know, you have to know so much about the structure of the food itself. And then ironically, really fell in love with it through my time in school and then through my first jobs at Kraft Foods and at General Mills. Um, and I got to work on a variety of different projects, some of them that people would consider kind of the undesirable work. So a lot in convenience and food service, you know, things like bulk yogurt that ends up in schools or hospitals. But I really liked that work because it meant I got a huge amount of autonomy. I got to learn about so many different parts and functions of the business itself. And the decisions I made, even though I didn't get the glory of being able to go up to a shelf in a grocery store and hold up a product and say, oh, this is mine. I knew that I got to feed, for instance, you know, 70 to 80 percent of the school kids in the nation, the yogurt that they ate at lunch every day, which if you want to talk about kind of impact of a job, it doesn't really get any bigger than that. And I loved that. I, I loved working with food. I've, I've always kind of had two core passions in life, which was cooking and, and feeding people and finding ways to help others. And so food science was a great blend for me in that way. But as I started to progress more in my career, I came to kind of this realization that nobody needed another strawberry flavored yogurt. <laughs> um, <laughs> the world had bigger fish to fry than trying to figure out, you know, novel exopolysaccharide fermentation to create yogurts with, you know, lower starch levels and, and uh, healthier profiles. And I mean, it, that works really important. I'm glad people are doing it, but it just didn't get me up in the morning. And the fact, especially working at a place like General Mills, where I, I love the people I worked with. It's a fabulous company. And in, in the world of, of big food companies, they really are doing right by their consumers. It just didn't get me up in the morning, like double digit shareholder profit, trying to, you know, meet, beat quarterly earnings reports, just like didn't give me the zest of life that I wanted it to. And at the same time, I got to do some really amazing work with pro bono consulting um, with about 10% of my time of, of my daily job, with small and growing dairy companies in Ethiopia and other parts of Africa. And that work increasingly became a heck of a lot more fun than my day job and just so incredibly impactful. I mean, some minor projects and things just really contributing a small amount of my time was revolutionizing the way that we thought about the dairy industry in an entire country. And, and I got to go teach quality seminars in Addis Ababa and see some of my projects on the ground. And it was clear to me in that moment, you know, truly as many strawberry yogurts as we could make, there were so many other things to be working on. And that inspired me to actually leave my cushy corporate job in my hometown, which my family was all horrified by, and depart and go to business school, which is pretty non-traditional. I've always been really passionate and focused on malnutrition, food access, food insecurity, really thinking about how are we going to feed the planet sustainably and ethically by 2050. And I increasingly saw that even the decisions in those spaces being made definitely were tied back to business. And I had this feeling that I kind of had to join them to beat them a little bit, that if we wanted to find truly important interventions in this world, we were going to have to be more creative and think about sustainable business models to get there. So I came to Duke here in North Carolina, where I, I live now, for social impact and entrepreneurship at the Fuqua School of Business, and had a lot of friends who were bankers and consultants and working for all the various evil empires. And then there was me, focused on global food systems change, taking a lot of policy courses, uh, joining the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and their private sector partnerships team for nutrition, and really just exploring this world and trying to find unique leverage points that might be able to combat malnutrition. And so fast forwarding to you know Gates Foundation and that, that time and experience, I got to work on a really cool project in the alternative protein space, looking at scaling up technologies in Southeast Asia and got to dig in there in a way that really introduced me to the first 1,000 days of life and how vital the nutrition is for a child in, in those first, first years, really. And breast milk is such an important part of that journey, and infant formula is such a unique and kind of specialized industry or sector within food. And I became super obsessed, <laughs> to be honest. Mm -hmm. I don't have any kids, um, so it was kind of weird to be a business student 
strangely obsessed with infant formula and, and mom's breastfeeding habits and <laughs> really deeply there. But I really felt like, you know, we could possibly prevent global malnutrition if we could find better nutritional options for kids earlier in life. And if we could help and assist in that breastfeeding journey and find other options for those who couldn't. And I met Layla through a mutual friend because she saw that I was bizarrely obsessed uh, and knew Layla had been working on milk outside of the body. Layla, my, my CSO, since 2013, since about when Mark Post first has made his hamburgers. And the rest was kind of history. It was clear that you know she had had an incredible time trying to breastfeed her two kids at the same time as having finished up her postdoc at Stanford and had been working on this technology on her own dime on a you know, we called it her strange science hobby. And had been just kind of working on it as this novelty before it's time. Everyone thought she was crazy to talk about milk outside of the body here in North Carolina. And it just happened to the right time and right place. And it was clear that the problem we're trying to solve, you know, no matter pandemic or famine or war is the same. It's, it's always, infants are always looking for ways to feed and parents are always trying to find better ways to get better nutritional food to their, to their children. And um, the rest is kind of history. Wow, that's quite the journey from distribution of large-scale strawberry yogurt and development to (laughs) milk outside the body. It's really inspiring to hear your story. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about where Biomilk is right now? How many employees do you have? Yeah, so Biomilk went from being this hobby (laughs) of Layla and I into a business about this time last year only. We had been kind of working on it on and off and um, it became clear that we really had a lot of traction and a lot of momentum. And I was I was still in the midst of, of school. I was still a full-time student. And so just kind of became a full-time student and a, and a full-time business operator. <laughs> and so we, we fundraised successfully this spring and we're able to bring in cash. So we, we now have hired, there are five of us full-time to part-time and we've had a cadre of interns over the last couple of months and we're adding three additional roles. We're adding a human milk regulator um, and adding another scientific role and then adding a chief of staff, which I'm really excited to have someone else to come in and do some strategic heavy lifting with me. We have a lab space here in Research Triangle Park which for those who aren't familiar, I like to say like our neighbors are Syngenta and Biogen, literally, like we stare at their two different driveways and we're in a a smaller lab space, but we're surrounded by all of the juggernauts of the biotech and pharma world. So not necessarily as big in the food tech scene, everyone always talks about Berkeley or other parts of the Bay Area, but very, very technologically advanced here, especially in the Southeast and our incredibly lucky that we have plentiful lab space and surrounded by three fabulous universities, University of North Carolina, North Carolina State University, and then Duke. And so far have found this a wonderful place to not only call home personally, but call home for the Biomilk team. That's fantastic. Can you talk a little bit about like specifically what are you doing? I preface this a little bit in the introduction, but you're making breast milk basically, right? In a lab essentially. Yeah. So we're making cultured breast milk, which really in is really quite simplistic technologically. You know, it sounds like pigs flying to many people, but honestly, we're really leveraging technology that has been around since the eighties and nineties and just utilizing it in a different novel way. So similar to kind of biologics manufacturing or drug production, you know, we're using a type of bioreactor that enables the cells to arrange themselves the way they would in the body. So human mammary epithelial cells are our cell type of choice. They line the mammary gland, both in the female and male body. And under the right stimulation, they're able to produce milk. And one of the really kind of secrets to their success is that like your skin, they're an epithelial cell. And so they're able to arrange themselves where they create this this layer, which means they can pull in nutrients from in the body, you know, blood and from our device media and able to turn on their biosynthetic pathways and secrete milk um, out the other side. So they really never mix any of the kind of inputs and the outputs. And that's really key as someone who's spent most of her career studying dairy, both in cows and in humans, it's incredibly complex. And we like to kind of think of milk as this perfect constellation. Everything is produced in its exact form and isomeric kind of quantification and it's really important because you think about all these molecules have so much interaction together, these macro and micronutrients of milk. And so one needs another component to be able to be carried appropriately to the infant gut, for instance, to be able to populate for immunological benefit. 
And if you start to try to create one component by one and reblend, or you try to separate out a bunch of components from media and all of these other complicated liquids and fluids, it just becomes really complicated and you're going to lose a lot of that nutritional value. So really where we're able to be successful is because of this technological kind of leap forward by pulling from pharma and pulling from food, we're able to create a product that is wholly milk at the point where it's secreted and doesn't require a huge amount of downstream purification or separation or concentration in any way. It's it's really kind of like we've made a, a breast outside of the body to some extent. Oh, wow. That's really, really cool. Let's say I'm a mother and I potentially want to purchase some of this breast milk. Is there a way to have it tailored to a specific makeup of what my breast milk would be? Yeah. So that's actually kind of where it does get a little sci-fi in my mind is, you know, we can take a cell sample from anyone, male or female, and produce their milk. Which, wow. <laughs> yeah. Every time we get to talk to LGBTQI identifying parents, they're always like, wait, like, you could make anyone's milk? And we're like, yeah, I mean, theoretically, like we, we can make anyone's <laughs> milk. And, you know, it's so strange because milk is such, I mean, it's the elixir of life. Like it supports all mammalian life on this planet. And yet there is such a strong ingratiation in our culture and in and, and humanity of like mothering is very much associated with milk. And, and it absolutely should be. Breastfeeding is by far and the way, the best way to feed your child. And there are many ways that our product will not look the same in terms of how it's delivered and the immunological benefits of, of human breast milk. But we are able to take a cell sample and grow up what your cells would make on their own naturally just outside of the body. So we can make custom product. We can make a more general product for many people and are pursuing and looking at kind of all of our options as we come to market for what's best for consumers. That's incredible. Super, super exciting. And yeah, I can imagine so many mothers would be just elated by that information or the possibility of that. Yeah. And so many dads, actually, it's really dads who get pretty jazzed. Moms are like, um, you know, for a lot of women, breastfeeding is already a part of their journey and and they're already sharing their specific milk. And so they're kind of like, yeah, but I'm looking for a bridge for the rest of the times, right? Like I'm looking for when I have to go back to work or this or that. And like, it feels good that I can have my own milk, but like, whatever, I'd already kind of mentally made the trade off. The idea for a lot of dads or other caregivers, you know, you think of adopted children or you think of parents, grandparents caring for kids or extended family, that's where you start to hear people get really, really excited because this means they have kind of that mechanism for bonding in some ways that they may not have been able to access before. So in theory, a father could give you some of his cells and you could create a breast milk with the cells from his body. Exactly. We could make a uh, man's milk sounds kind of weird. Uh, father's milk? I, I don't know. I don't, we, haven't, we haven't quite uh, done our brand work on that yet to come up with a good name for it. But um, yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. Are you thinking about doing any other species of animals or of mammals rather? Yeah, we, we have a number we're working on now and we're, we're pretty close to our vest about, about what we think about. But, you know, when you think of endangered species in this country, in this world, there's some fascinating opportunities also, just the difference in milks produced by different mammals always blows my mind. It is so impressive how different animal to animal, even in the same species, but in different parts of the world, you're seeing different milk compositions. And so humans are pretty habituated, especially in the Western world, to drink cow's milk. But there are so many other mammalian milks, both for the mammals themselves, that could be an interesting opportunity for animals in captivity or, or being brought back into the environment or just for humans also to consume. You know, we we make a lot of cow's milk and consume it, but like, I don't know, zebra cheese sounds kind of exciting in a weird way. So <laughs> um, there's all kinds of really interesting opportunities. And, you know, we, we are really focused on mother's milk and that's our passion. That's our mission. You know, we put moms and babies at the center of everything that we do. And so that's really the place that we're starting because it just has such potential to unlock change for humanity. But this technology, one of the reasons Layla even started working on it was just the potential for, for change on the planet. Like it's just, it's, it's really pretty amazing to think that we could create a liquid outside of the body that truly supports a majority of life on this planet in a way that we've never been able to unlock before. Absolutely. That's a very impressive goal. Is it going to have the same taste and the same texture as the milk that you're replicating from the animal or the mammal or the mom? <laughs> yeah, everyone always wants to know how it tastes. I'm always like, how many people are tasting breast milk now? This is always like an interesting, when we're doing consumer interviews, it's always fascinating to see who will fess up to like, oh yeah, I've tasted my own breast milk or who are like kind of sheepish or embarrassed about it. Yeah, I mean, taste-wise, the taste and structure and function of milk 
really does come from that kind of constellation I described earlier. So the way milk is is arranged and macro and micronutrients actually provides that texture and that mouthfeel and the aroma and the flavor. And so because we're having the cells do the heavy lifting, we're not adapting or adding or changing the product once the, once it's produced by the cells for the most part. That flavor profile is really set by those cells on their own because it's what they're producing specifically. So I can't say that we've done any side-by-side trials between mom and <laughs> mom and out of the bi reactor for a baby yet, but from what I've been told, babies don't have that discerning of a palate <laughs> until a little later in their development anyway is, is the good news. We have a little less fussy of a customer in some ways than maybe somebody looking at a plant-based burger. But yeah, I mean, when you think about the kind of flavor and texture, it's really the, the components of the milk are what make that up, not any additions or, or post-processing for the most part. That makes sense. And yeah, to your point, fair enough that your uh, consumer is just going to be happily getting nourishment versus complaining about the, the mouthfeel and the texture at this point in time. Yeah, I, I don't think most babies are are telling you with their words when they don't like something, at least that's for sure. When can we expect this to be on the market and be available to moms? The top question all moms have for us, that's for sure. We think three to five years is approximate where we're aiming for. Theoretically, we could have a product in less than 18 months, but the FDA is a is a fickle structure. And to be honest, you know, we're looking to feed the most important beings on the planet. So you would hope that there are many hurdles and hoops we have to jump through to prove that it's safe and effective. So we have a quite a consumer and regulatory journey in front of us. And so if we can get there faster, we're all about it. But, um, you know, as two conservatively trained scientists, I would say conservative in the manner of, you know, not over promising, we're pretty cautious in saying it's going to take us a while to get all the way through the regulatory pathway and come to market in a way that we we want to be able to talk to consumers about the product. That makes sense. And have you already been in touch with the USDA or the FDA yet? And if so, how has that gone? Yeah, we're keeping everything pretty tight-lipped as we're still kind of in early stages here in conversations. To be honest, no one really knows what to do with us either. You know, we're just kind of out of everyone's wheelhouse <laughs> a bit in terms of, of what the product is and how it's produced and, and who it's fed to. So there's still a lot of unknowns about how to think about the product, what to call the product. But the really good news is, as you know, and part of the reason we're hiring another role in for this is that there are a lot of you know, the problem we're trying to solve fundamentally affects a lot of women in the world. But there's a lot of kind of unintended consequences of the way our structures around infant nutrition are set up today, you know, from a regulatory and from a kind of an institutional sense. And so there's a lot of really fascinating and challenging places that we face here in the US and beyond, in terms of, you know, illegal black markets, in terms of looking at kind of misaligned incentive systems around WIC or, you know, like SNAP dollars for moms to receive infant formula versus other products. And then there's there's kind of a, a whole world too of of actually treating indications or treating illnesses in children. So like NICU infants, for instance, are a at risk population that infant nutrition is incredibly important for. And so when you take a look at kind of where our product fits for the average healthy baby and, and mom versus where it could fit for other opportunities where there really are some interesting ways that we can help adjust and level set infant nutrition more broadly, that's where we get really excited to be able to have conversations, not just with regulators, but with policymakers and otherwise to really think about how does this product layer into our world societally <laughs> and how do we do so in a way that encourages people to participate, but doesn't necessarily push out some of the beautiful things about the breastfeeding journey and experience for a lot of moms. That makes a ton of sense. I'm curious, it sounds like you've already done a lot of research and user testing to find out you know, about interest and things like that. Who has been the most interested in your product thus far on your journey? Hmm, that's a good question. I think, so, you know, Moms in general that we have been speaking to are ones mostly that have reached out to us, you know, have already heard about the product or want to know more about it or have specific questions. And they're usually either um, about to give birth to their first child or in between kind of first and second often. And I would say our moms that are typically already more a little bit more informed about infant nutrition, about infant formula, about breastfeeding. And so they always just have a lot of questions that they, they want to learn more about which I would say is, is maybe like they're just more excited about the product because they've seen how the challenges have affected their lives or the lives of their friends or family. 
But I think kind of an interesting anecdote that we've been seeing is, you know, we, we always open a lot of these interviews with what questions can we answer for you? You know, before we dive in and, and want to ask you endlessly, like, what are some of the things that you have for us? Because everybody always has a bunch of questions that they're like, is this a dumb question? I'm like, no, none of this is a dumb question. It's a whole new frontier. Like, every question is fair game. And the question I get long before I get questions about safety or about the product taste or form is always, how are you going to make sure that moms don't use this product instead of breastfeeding? And I think it's such an interesting kind of view into the the experience of a lot of moms where there's a lot of mommy shaming going on. There's a lot of guilt around using infant formula or not breastfeeding. And there's a lot of rationalization, I would say, around decisions that are being made. And so I think it's fascinating that even for moms who really are supportive of the product, they think this product needs to exist because there is a problem for a lot of moms out there. There's still this lingering worry of will moms not do what's best for their child because there's an easier option. There's always like this concern of judging someone else of like, maybe they're not going to follow through on the way we would want them to. And I think it's so fascinating because the moment you call it out, every mom that you talk to is like, oh God, you're right. Like, I wouldn't do that. I still want to breastfeed my child. Why would I assume that someone else wouldn't want to do what's best for their child? But it's so ingratiated in our culture and in how we raise children, especially here in the U.S., that it's it's fascinating to see how those things kind of percolate to the surface. And I think is like, it, it's almost every interview that it comes up. It's just fascinating to me to think that we can kind of be so blind sometimes in how we perceive how others use products or how others think about taking care of their kids. When at the end of the day, we would hope everyone would give us the grace to be making decisions that's the best for our family as well. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation to note how much of it is just U.S. centric. Like, have you heard people from other countries having these same types of remarks? No, we have. That's what's interesting. I actually had a day where I had interviews in the UK, outside of New Delhi and India, and then a mom here in California. And all three moms asked it at almost the same time in almost the same way. The same question. I truly believe that it comes back to, you know, we we all know that breast milk is best. And even even you talk to, to women who are not yet moms or aren't even expecting, and they already have like ground into their minds, right? That breast is best, breast is best. And I think to be a naysayer to that, it feels like wrong (laughs) to some extent. Like, even though I think many people will agree, like, well, no matter what, we want you to feed and nourish your child. If breastfeeding is not an option for you, you know, we want you to still, of course, allow your child to thrive on something. But I think it's just kind of the lingering effects of, of such a mostly positive campaign and encouraging moms to think about breastfeeding that that's always kind of the first thing is okay well if breast is best but now you're telling me I can get breast milk outside of the breast are people not going to follow that that anymore but I always like to point out our product is not immunologically equivalent we're you know we're not producing any kind of immunity we are focusing as much as possible on nutritional value of the product and so if you can breastfeed you absolutely should This is really a product for when breastfeeding isn't feasible or just doesn't fit into their daily realities and you're looking for another option where where BioMilk really can step in and help fill that gap. I think that's a really important distinction for you to make as well. There was so much bad press and, and research that's come out about the effects of infant formula versus breast milk throughout the years. I wonder if maybe some of the cautions that these moms are having, like the the wariness that they're showing and and talking to you about has to do with putting bio milk in that category closer to formula than to than to breast milk itself. I'm okay with I mean, we're not we're not a formula. We don't formulate anything. We don't get to add anything back or adjust any ingredients. As someone who is excited to have her own kids and, and sees all of the studies and nutritional value that human milk has versus cow's milk. I would, I would rather any day that a mom focus on trying to get the resources she needs to breastfeed and only turning to bio milk when it's clear that she's just not going to be able to exclusively breastfeed in the way that she wanted. That makes sense. So I know you're a good three to five years out. Have you thought about that consumer pitch of how to convince moms to be or moms that are struggling with breastfeeding to try out bio milk? If you had asked me this when we first got started, I would have had a long pitch for you with all of the supporting data and information. And, you know, honestly, as we've been doing these interviews, the product speaks for itself. Moms, I actually had someone compare to me the other day that moms deciding how to feed their kids is like somebody researching buying a car. (laughs) 
<laughs> like you spend <laughs> hours looking at every single model and every single version and you do all the research on all the features and the benefits and the cost and like moms are doing an incredible amount of research. Even moms who really don't have the time, you know, they're working multiple jobs or just trying to make ends meet are thinking really deeply about how they're feeding their kids, maybe even better than how they're thinking about feeding themselves. And so we don't, we don't really have to do a lot of convincing about if you can get even, you know, a hundred steps closer to breast milk, that that will be a better product than bovine derived infant formula. And so really what we're focusing on right now is less about how do we craft the perfect pitch to influence and instead trying to think about how do we participate and activate important conversations about infant nutrition in this space? How do we really be an ally and be an information gatherer and disseminator so that parents can make the informed choice for them? Because I think plenty of moms and plenty of parents and caregivers will have a reason why BioMilk will fit them. We really actually want to spend more time making sure that it's the right fit for them and that they feel comfortable in their choice and that it empowers them on this incredible journey they're taking in raising a child rather than trying to uh, sell them on it. I, I think the product doesn't require a lot of sales. It actually requires a lot more nuanced conversation about what does this mean for you in a broader context of being a woman, in a broader context of being a mom, and in a broader context of being a human. I love that. I think that makes a ton of sense. And it's great to take that more holistic view too, because like you said, you're not trying to push a product on somebody that doesn't need it. You're trying to provide support for the people that do. Exactly. Yeah. What have been some of your biggest challenges thus far? <laughs> um, like through the entirety of the journey in the recent days, in the last 24 hours. <laughs> so I think one of the ex exciting and challenging parts of being a young and small startup is you're young and small with big aspirations and you're always outgrowing what you have. You know, we, it was Layla and I for a long time. And then we brought in a couple of employees, a couple of teammates who are awesome. And it's become clear we've all reached capacity of what we have. And so now we're out hiring again. And now we're like, gosh, we're not even all going to fit in the one space that we've rented <laughs> and the lab that we have. It's kind of this always like, People always joke it's kind of a rocket ship, but it really does feel like it some days where, you know, you just finished building and you're like, okay, you know, wipe my hands. We're ready to go. Now we can just focus and and it, it never stops. It just keeps growing and growing, which is like one of the best challenges to have. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And I, I feel lucky every day, but it's a lot. I mean, it, it, there's just so much that's constantly changing and so many things that we have to worry about and think about and work on. Um, so keeping on ahead of that and on top of that is kind of just a, a daily challenge, I would say. And then a broader, more macroeconomic lens challenge, I would say, is just thinking about how we fit into the greater context and, and world. So back to that, like, what does this mean to be a human? Bringing human milk to be available outside of the body, bringing cultured breast milk to the world is pretty foundationally different from literally since we were cave people. <laughs> <laughs> thinking about nourishing and raising our young in a lot of ways. And so a lot of the challenges we see are around, you know, how do we talk about this product? How do we engage meaningfully with people who are worried about the product? How do we think about the, both the positive benefits and the ramifications of our product existing, which we already talked about, like mom's not breastfeeding, of course, is a question everybody has. And we probably over-index on how much time we think and worry about those types of things. I think we were actually talking about like, maybe we just need someone who's like a bioethicist on our team, because I think the amount that we really dig in and think about how exciting this is, but also how groundbreaking it is just for people is, is kind of overwhelming. And there's so much to unpack there and so much to worry about. And, and we really want to bring this product to market in a manner that it, it can serve the most people possible. It's accessible to as many as possible. But that also means that it's going to be disruptive. And, you know, we're not a tech company that can move fast and break things. We're talking about feeding babies differently. So no breaking is allowed. <laughs> you really have to right. do it right. Be careful the first time and make sure that um, you're coming to market in a way that you can be proud of. The self-cultured food industry is so new just in general, too, that there's no playbook, there's no set of rules or even guidelines or even FDA regulations at this point. I think one of the things that gets me most stressed out about the industry is just um, some of the kind of elitist trends that, that Cell Ag has. So, you know, we're really proud to be in Durham, North Carolina, which is 
a biotech hub, but most people have never been to or heard of. And we are very cognizant of that this product, we want to be accessible to not just wealthy moms in wealthy countries, but to moms across the world. I think we probably have to tackle and wrestle with some of those issues more than maybe a cultivated meat company because the customer we're trying to serve, you know, differentially, if you feed a child breast milk versus infant formula, their outcomes cognitively and developmentally that are distinct. So you're not quite talking about a better for you fish patty or hamburger or this or that. Like you're talking about maybe a kid reaching fuller potential in their life, whether they get one product or another. And so the stakes are a little higher and we can't really afford to rest on our laurels as, as that as that this product will just be for people who can pay a lot for it. And, and everybody always talks about you got to bring the unit economics down. You got to be able to make it affordable by make, getting it to more people. And, th- and that is a big part of the unlocking equation, even for us. But I don't think it's ever too early as an industry to start to, start to think about how do we become more mainstream, not just in trying to end up in fast food chains or you know, ways that can quickly unlock volume, but also in, in ways about that people perceive and accept your products as not being elitist, as being designed for them. And that's where I think my classical training coming and having worked in large food companies that I, and I've worked on products from everything from lower income consumers to natural and organic, you know, grain free snacks and, and really thinking about, OK, if, if you're going to design products and you're going to try to bring them to market in a way that reaches as many people as possible, you have to be inclusive and you have to bring people along for that journey. You can't just design for San Francisco and New York and hope the rest adopts it because it's a trend. And and that I do worry about as a broader industry that we all need to focus more on. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, especially because like you said, you're not just creating some kind of burger or replication of a protein. This is for children. So how do you make sure that it's accessible? Have you been in touch with any other folks in the cell cultured milk industry, like Turtle Tree Labs in Singapore, for example, or anyone else? We've spoken to almost everybody at this point, varying levels, I would say, of interaction and and relationship. But in general, it's kind of our sentiment that all ships rise in a rising tide. I think even, you know, we'll get asked like, oh, well, people are making components of milk and reblending, you know, are they a competitor? And the answer is genuinely no. (laughs) Even just the space of infant nutrition is a large enough category that I don't think there's going to be one supreme winner. And then as you look to broader dairy and mammalian milks, the world is kind of these companies' oysters a little bit. So, you know, we, we've we had friendly conversations with everyone that we've spoken with across infant nutrition, across the broader dairy, including Turtle Tree. And I would say at this point, you know, it's beneficial that we exist because it socializes with more people, this product, and that this industry and sector is coming. And it'll be interesting to see kind of as everybody evolves and develops and grows, what different forms and product categories and and regions of the world we all we all play most in i do i think it's for some reason infant nutrition is not for some reason for many reasons it's a pretty politicized space it's very emotional i mean it speaks to kind of the one of the fundamental truths of humanity and so because of that it's a pretty concentrated space in terms of current suppliers so like the current companies in the infant formula space are, are pretty large and concentrated. And so that does, I think, when you think about kind of the broader competitive ecosystem, it's kind of an interesting world in that there's plenty of space for many people to, to be, but there's only a few names usually that are strongly associated with it. So when we think about engaging in kind of a broader, both cell-based and beyond worlds, there aren't really that many groups that really are pretty active here. That makes sense. Do you have a price point in mind yet? So we don't have a a price point exacting yet because we're still, I would say, in in relatively early stages, but we are confident based on our current economic modeling that we can be price competitive with the top end of infant formula. So we, we know that at launch, we can be competitive out in the marketplace and be able to be a viable option for a lot of parents, you know, still not necessarily be the least expensive option on the shelf and definitely where my passion is in getting to low and middle income countries around the world, we are ways off from being able to really expand in some of those global markets probably, but we can bring the cost down enough, at least here in the U S and Europe and other more Western markets to be able to be an option that a a parent could go and pick up off the shelf or order online today. That's great. Okay. One more question for you, and this is a little more long-term thinking, but where do you see the cell cultured food industry specifically when it comes to breast milk in the next five to 10 years? 
Hmm. I think it's important to note that I do not see a world, which this is a very unpopular view in cellular agriculture, so I apologize in advance saying this, but I do not see a world where we just have abandoned all animal agriculture and only get milk from cell-based milk companies and only get meat from cell-based meat companies. I, as a purveyor of dairy products, <laughs> a lover of dairy products and, and a you know, fermentation scientist, there are some really beautiful benefits that come out of, for instance, small pasture-raised dairy farms that have beautiful aromas and flavors and structures, you know, back to how is it going to taste and be that mimicking in a lab would be really hard and, and genuinely not, not as artisanal. So I imagine that in infant nutrition, we will make significant strides in the next five to 10 years where, you know, we can be a viable option. We can genuinely be something that parents can turn to as another bridge to solid food and a better nutritional option even later into life. You know, I think a lot of parents would love to be able to breastfeed for a couple of years. And like that, just most moms will tell you is far longer than they want to have a child attached to their breast. And so I think in that way, you know, we might really revolutionize the way you actually think about feeding your children longer term across longer swaths of early development. But I don't see us replacing all milk. I think there's always going to be a small niche for artisanal quality production still through animal husbandry. And I just hope that the work we can be doing can remove enough percentage of the kind of commoditized feedlot global marketplace that we can reduce the climate impacts that are truly the most pernicious. And we can be available where parents and families don't have to make as many trade-offs about the carbon they're producing or about the environmental harm that they're creating and in the animal products they're picking. Got it. That makes a ton of sense. And I, I think it's a lovely philosophy to have too. There's so many proponents out there of cell cultured agriculture, replacing agriculture completely. And yeah, I think maybe in a hundred years from now, that might be the case when we're all living in space. But for now, I think there's, there's a spot for both and it's great to have options. Congratulations on working on something that's just so revolutionary, that's really going to help moms have a little bit more leeway when it comes to breastfeeding and have more options when it comes to personalized nutrition for their babies. Yeah. And it's really, really cool what you're working on. So thank you. thank you. Thanks for being on the show today. It was lovely chatting with you. I've learned a ton and I'm really excited to share this with the world. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate your time today as well. It's rare that I get to take some time to just have a chat instead of <laughs> be doing paperwork or <laughs> trying to find people to hire. So it's it's exciting to be able to have a moment to be reminded why we do this work, not just what work has to get done. Wonderful. Thanks again. Bye-bye.